Walk to Moon, set 8, chapters 29 through 32. The tide rises. Did Phoebe's mother call? Graham said. Did she come home? Did Phoebe phone the police? Oh, I hope this isn't a sad story. Phoebe did go to the police. It was on the day that Mr. Buckway read us the poem about the tide and the traveler, a poem that upset both me and Phoebe, and I think it's what it is what convinced her, finally, that she had to tell the police about her mother. Mr. Buckway read a poem by Longfellow, The Tide Rises and the Tide Falls. The way Mr. Bookway read this poem, you could hear the tide rising and falling, rising and falling. In the poem, a traveler is hurrying toward a town, and it is getting darker and darker, and the sea calls to the traveler. Then the waves, with their soft white hands, wash out the traveler's footprints. The next morning, the day returns, but never more, returns the traveler to the shore. And the tide rises, the tide falls. Mr. Bookway asked for reactions to this poem. Megan said it sounded soft and gentle, and it almost made her go to sleep. Gentle, I said. It's terrifying. My voice was shaken. Someone is walking along the beach, and the night is getting black, and the person keeps looking behind him to see if someone is following, and a jing-bang wave comes up and pulls him into the sea. A murder, Phoebe said. I went barreling on as if it was my poem and I was an expert. The waves, with their soft white hands, grab the traveler. They drown him. They kill him. He's gone. Finn said, maybe he didn't drown. Maybe he just died like normal people die. Phoebe said, he drowned. I said, it isn't normal to die. It isn't normal. It's terrible. Megan said, what about heaven? What about God? Mary Lou said, God? Is he in this poem? Ben said, maybe dying could be normal and terrible. When the bell rang, I raced out of the room. Phoebe grabbed me. Come on, she said from her locker. She took the evidence that she had brought from home, and we both ran the six blocks to the police station. I'm not exactly sure why I went along with Phoebe. Maybe it was because of that poem about the traveler, or maybe it was because I had begun to believe in the lunatic. Or maybe it was because Phoebe was taking some action, and I admired her for it. I wish I had taken some action when my mother left. I was not sure what I would have done, but I wish I had done something. Phoebe and I stood for five minutes outside the police station, trying to make our hearts slow down. And then we went inside and stood at the corner counter. On the other side of it, a thin man with big ears was writing in a black book. Excuse me, Phoebe said. I'll be right with you, he said. This is absolutely urgent. I need to speak to somebody about a murder, Phoebe said. He looked up quickly. A murder? Yes, Phoebe said, or possibly a kidnapping, but the kidnapping might turn into a murder. Is this a joke? It is not a joke, Phoebe said. Just a minute, he whispered to a plump woman in a dark blue uniform. She wore glasses with thick lenses. Is this... Is this something that you girls have read about in a book? She asked. No, it is not, I said. That was a, a turning point. I think when I came to Phoebe's defense, I didn't like the way the woman was looking at us. And if we were two fools, I wanted that woman to understand why Phoebe was so upset. I wanted her to believe Phoebe. May I ask who it, it is that was kidnapped or possibly murdered? The woman said. Phoebe said, my mother. Oh, your mother. Come along, then. Her voice was sugary and sweet, as if she was speaking to tiny children. <clears throat> we followed her to a room with glass partitions. An enormous man with a huge head and neck and massive shoulders sat beside, behind the desk. His hair was bright red, and his face was covered in freckles. He did not smile when we entered. After the woman repeated what we had told her, he stared at us for a long time. His name was Sergeant Bickle, and Phoebe told him everything. She explained about her mother disappearing and the note from, from Mrs. Cadaver and Mrs. Cadaver's missing husband and the rhododendron, and finally about the lunatic and the mysterious messages. At, at that point, Sergeant Bickle said, What sort of messages? Phoebe was prepared. She pulled them out of her book bag and laid them on the desk in order in which they had arrived. 
he read each one aloud. Don't judge a man until you've walked two moons in his moccasins. Everyone has his own agenda. In the course of a lifetime, what does it matter? You can't keep the birds of sadness from flying over your head, but you can keep them from nesting in your hair. Sergeant Beckel looked up at the woman seated next to us, and the corners of his mouth twitched slightly. To Phoebe, he said, and How do you think these are related to your mother's disappearance? I don't know, she said. That's what I want you to find out. Sergeant Bickel asked Phoebe to spell Mrs. Cadaver's name. It means corpse, Phoebe said. Dead body. Ah, I know. Is there anything else? Phoebe pulled out the envelope with the unidentified hair strand. Perhaps you could have these analyzed, see, she suggested. Sergeant Bickle looked at the woman, and again the corners of his mouth twitched slightly. The woman removed her glasses and wiped the lenses. They were not taking us seriously, and I felt my ornery donkey self waking up. I mentioned the potential blood spots that Phoebe had marked with adhesive tape. But my father removed the tape, Phoebe said. Sergeant Bickle said, I wonder if you could excuse me a few minutes. He asked the woman to stay with us, and he left the room. The woman asked Phoebe about school and about her family. She had an awful lot of questions. I kept wondering where Ser Sergeant Bickle had gone and when he was coming back. He was gone for an hour. There were three framed pictures on Sergeant Bickle's desk. I tried to lean forward to see them, but I couldn't. I was afraid the woman would think that I was nosy. Sergeant Bickle finally returned. Behind him was Phoebe's father. Phoebe looked extensively relieved, but I knew it was not a coincidence that her father was there. Miss Winterbottom, Sergeant Bickle said, your father is going to take you and your friend home now. But, Phoebe said, Mr. Winterbottom will be in touch, and if you would like me to speak with Mrs. Cadaver, oh no, Mr. Winterbottom said. He looked embarrassed. Really, that won't be necessary. I do apologize. We followed Mr. Winterbottom outside. In the car, he said nothing. I thought he might drop me off at my house, but he didn't. When we got to their house, the only thing he said was, Phoebe, I'm going to go talk with Mrs. Cadaver. You and Sal wait here. Mrs. Cadaver was unable to give him any more information about Phoebe's mother's call. All Mrs. Winterbottom had said was that she would phone soon. That's all? Phoebe asked. Your mother also asked Mrs. Cadaver how you and Prudence were. Mrs. Cadaver told her that you and Prudence were fine. Well, I am not fine, Phoebe said. And what does Mrs. Cadaver know anyway? And besides, Mrs. Cadaver is making the whole thing up. You should let the police talk to her. You should ask her about the rhododendron. You should find out who this lunatic is. Mrs. Cadaver probably hired him. You should, Phoebe, your imagination is running away with you. It is not. Mom loves me, and she would not leave me without any explanation. And then her father began to cry. Breaking in. Gold dang, Graham said. What a lot of birds of sadness wing dinging their way around Peavy's family. Graham said, You liked Peavy, didn't you, Salamanca? I did like Phoebe. In spite of all her wild tales and her cholesterol madness and her annoying comments, there was something about Phoebe that was like a magnet. I was drawn to her. I was pretty sure that underneath all that odd behavior was someone who was frightened. And in a strange way, she was like another version of me. She acted out the way that I sometimes felt. I do not think that Phoebe actually planned to break into Mrs. Cadaver's house. But as Phoebe was... She saw Mrs. Cadaver in her nurse's uniform, get into her car and leave. Phoebe waited until her father was asleep, and then she phoned me. You've got to come over, she said. It's urgent. But Phoebe, it's late. It's, it's dark. It's urgent, Sal. Phoebe was waiting in front of Mrs. Cadaver's house. There, was no, there were no lights on at Mrs. Cadaver's. Phoebe said, come on. And she started up the walk. I admit that I was reluctant. I just want to take a quick look she said. She crept up onto the porch and stood by the door. She listened, tapped twice, and turned the doorknob. The door was un unlocked. I don't think Phoebe intended to go inside, but she did, and I followed. 
we stood in the dark hallway. In the room to the right, a shaft of light from the street lamp came in through the window. We went into that room. We both nearly leaped through the window when someone said, Sal? I started backing toward the door. It's a ghost, Phoebe said. Come here, the voice said. As my eyes adjusted to the dim light, I could see someone huddled in a chair in the far corner. When I saw the cane, I was relieved. Mrs. Partridge? Come over here, she said. Who's that with you? Is that Phoebe? Phoebe said, yes. Her voice was high and quivery. I was just sitting here reading, Mrs. Partridge said. Isn't it awfully dark in here? I said, bumping a table. Mrs. Partridge laughed, her wicked laugh. <laughs> it's always dark in here. I don't need lights, but you can turn some on if you want to. As I stumbled around looking for a lamp, Phoebe stood frozen near the doorway. There, I said. That's much better. Mrs. Partridge was sitting in a big, overstuffed chair. She was wearing a purple bathrobe and pink slippers with fluffy bunny ears at the toes. On her lap was a book. Fingers resting on the page. Is it Braille? I asked, waving at Phoebe to come into the room. I was afraid she was going to run out and leave me. Mrs. Partridge handed me the book, and I slid my fingers over the raised bumps. How did you know it was us? I asked. I just knew. Your shoes make a particular sound, and you have a particular smell. What's the name of this book? What's it about? Mrs. Pottery said, Murder at Midnight. It's a mystery. Phoebe said, uh -huh, and looked around the room. Each time I went into the house, I noticed new things. It was a scary place. The walls were lined with shelves, crammed with old, musty books. On the floor were three rugs with dark, swirling patterns of wild beasts and forests. Two chairs were covered in similar ghastly designs. A sofa was draped in a bear skin. On the wall behind the couch were two thumpingly grim African masks. The mouths on the masks were wide open as if in the midst of a scream. Everywhere you looked, there was something startling. A stuffed squirrel, a kite in the shape of a dragon, a wooden cow with a spear pierce in its side. Goodness, Phoebe said, what a lot of, of unusual things. She knelt to examine a spot on the floor. What's the matter? Mrs. Partridge said. Phoebe jumped up. Nothing, nothing whatsoever. Did I drop something on the floor? Mrs. Partridge asked. No, nothing whatsoever on the floor, Phoebe said. Leaning against the back of the sofa was an enormous sword. Phoebe examined the blade. Careful you don't cut yourself, Mrs. Partridge said. Phoebe stepped back. Even I found this unsettling, that Mrs. Partridge could see what Phoebe was doing, even though she couldn't actually see her. Mrs. Partridge said, Isn't this a grandiful room? Grandiful, and a little peculiar, too, I suppose. Phoebe and I have to be going, we backed toward the door. By the way, Mrs. Partridge said as we reached the doorway, what was it you wanted? Phoebe looked at me, and I looked at Phoebe. We were just passing by, I said, and we thought we would see how you were doing. That's nice. Mrs. Partridge said, pat patting her knees. Oh, Phoebe, I think I met your brother. Phoebe said, I don't have a brother. Oh, Mrs. Partridge tapped her head. I guess this old dogget isn't as sharp as it used to be. As we left, she said, Goodness, you girls stay up late. Outside, Phoebe said, I'll make a list of items which the police will want to investigate further. The sword, the suspicious spot on the floor, and several hair strands which I picked up. Phoebe, you know, when you said that your mother would never leave without an explanation, well, she might. A person, a mother, might do that, Phoebe said. My mother wouldn't. My mother loves me. But she might love you and still not be, have been able to explain. I was thinking about the letter that my mother left me. Maybe it would be too painful for her to explain. Maybe it would seem too permanent. I don't know what in the world you are talking about. She might not come back, Phoebe. Shut up, Sal. 
She might not. I just think that you should be prepared. She is too coming back. You don't know what you're talking about. You're being horrid. Phoebe ran into the house. When I got home and had crept up to my room, I remembered how Phoebe had shown me how some things in her room that reminded her of a mother. A handmade birthday card, a photograph of Phoebe and her mother, and a bar of lavender soap. When Phoebe pulled a blouse out of the closet, she said that she could see her mother standing at the ironing board, smoothing the blouse with her hand. The wall opposite Phoebe's bed was painted violet, she said. My mother painted it last summer when I painted the trim at the bottom, and I knew exactly what Phoebe was doing and exactly why. I had done the same things when my mother left. My father was right. My mother did haunt our house in Bybanks and the fields and the barn. She was everywhere. You couldn't look at a single thing without being reminded of her. When we moved to Euclid, one of the first things that I did was to unpack gifts my mother had given me. On the wall, I tacked a poster of the red hen, which my mother had given me for my fifth birthday, and the drawing of the barn that she had given me for my last birthday. On my desk were pictures of her and cards from her. On the bookshelf, the wood animals and the books were, pre were presents from her. Sometimes... I would walk around the room and look at each of these things and try to remember exactly the day she had given them to me. I tried to picture what the weather was like and what room we were in and what she was wearing and what precisely she had said. This was not a game. It was a necessary, crucial thing to do. If I did not have these things and remember these occasions, then she might disappear forever. She might never have been. In my bureau were three things of hers that I had taken from her closet after she left. A red French shawl, a blue sweater, and a yellow flowered cotton dress that was always my favorite. These things had her smell on them. Once before she left, my mother said that if you visualize something happening, you can make it happen. For example, if you are about to run a race, you visualize yourself running the race and crossing the finish line first and presto. When the time comes, it really happens. The only thing that I did not understand was what if everyone visualized himself winning the race? Still, when she left, this is what I did. I visualized her reaching for the phone. Then I visualized her dialing the phone. I visualized her phone number clicking through the wires. I visualized the phone ringing. It did not ring. I visualized her riding the bus back to Bybanks. I visualized her walking up the driveway. I visualized her opening the door. It did not happen. While I was thinking about all of this that night after Phoebe and I crept into Mrs. Cadaver's house, I also thought about Ben. I had the sudden urge to run over to the Finneys and ask him where his own mother was, but it was too late. The Finneys would be asleep. Instead, I lay there thinking of the poem about the traveler, and I could see the tide rising and falling, and those horrid white hands snatching the traveler. How could it be normal? That traveler dying? And how could such a thing be normal and terrible both at the same time? I stayed awake the whole night. I knew that if I closed my eyes, I would see the tide in the white hands. I thought about Mr. Winterbottom crying. That was the saddest thing. It was sadder than seeing my own father cry, because my father is the sort of person you expect might cry if he was terribly upset. But I had never, ever expected Mr. Winterbottom, stiff Mr. Winterbottom, to cry. It was the first time I realized that he actually cared about Mrs. Winterbottom. As soon as it was daylight, I phoned Phoebe. Phoebe, we've got to find her. That's what I've been telling you, she said. The photograph. The next day was most peculiar, as Mrs. Partridge would say. Phoebe arrived at school with another message which she had found on her porch that morning. We never know the worth of water until the well is dry. It's a clue, Phoebe said. Maybe my mother is hidden in a well. I walked straight into Ben when I went to my locker. The grapefruit aroma was in the air. You've got something on your face, he said. With soft, warm fingers, he rubbed the side of my face. It's probably your breakfast. I don't know what came over me. I was going to kiss him. 
I leaned forward just as he turned around and slammed the door of his locker. My lips ended up pressed against the cold metal locker. You're weird, Sal, he said. Kissing was thumbingly complicated. Both people had to be in the same place at the same time, and both people had to remain still so that the kiss ended up in the right place. But I was relieved that my lips ended up on the cold metal locker. I could not imagine what had come over me or what might have happened if the kiss had landed on Ben's mouth. It was a shivering thing to consider. I made it through the rest of my classes without losing control of my lips. Mr. Bookway sailed into class carrying our journals. I had forgotten all about them. He was leaping over the place, exclaiming, Dynamite! Unbelievable! Incredible! He said he couldn't wait to share the journals with the class. Mary Louise Finney said, Share with the class? Mr. Bookaway said, oh, not to worry. Everyone has something magnificent to say. I, could, I haven't read through every page yet, but I wanted to share some of these passages with you right away. People were squirming all over the room. I was trying to remember what I had written. Mary Lou leaned over to me and said, well, I'm not worried. I wrote a special note in the front of mine, distinctly asking him not to read it. Mine was private. Mr. Bookway smiled at each nervous face. You needn't worry, he said. I'll change any names that you've used, and I'll um, fold a piece of yellow paper over the cover of whichever journal I'm reading so that you won't know who it is. Ben asked if he would go to the bathroom. Christy said she felt sick and begged to see the nurse. Phoebe asked me to touch her forehead because she was pretty sure that she had a fever. Usually, Mr. Bookway would let people go to the bathroom or to the nurse, but this time he said, It's not malinger. He picked up a journal, slipping the yellow paper over it before anyone had a chance to examine the cover for clues as to its author's identity. Everyone took a deep breath. You could see people poised and nervously waiting as tensely as if Mr. Bookway was going to announce someone's ex executive execution, Mr. Bookway read. I think that Betty, he changed the name that you could tell because there was no Betty in our school, will go to hell because she always takes the Lord's name in vain. She says, God, every five seconds. Mary Lou Finney was turning purple. Who wrote that? She said. Did you, Christy? I'll bet you did. Christy stared down at her desk. I do not say God every five seconds. I do not. And I am not going to hell. Omnipotent. That's what I say now. I say omnipotent and alpha and omega. Mr. Buckway was desperately trying to explain what he had enjoyed about the pa that passage. He said that most of us are not aware that we might be using words, such as God, that offend other people. Mary Lou leaned over to me and said, Is he serious? Does he actually really, really and truly believe the beef-brained Christie is troubled by my saying God, which I do not, by the way, say any more, anyway. Christy wore a pious look, as if God himself had just come down from heaven to sit on her desk. Mr. Bookway quickly selected another general, and he read, Linda, there was no Linda in our class either, is my best friend. I tell her just about everything, and, and she tells me everything, even things I do not want to know like what she ate for breakfast and what her father wears to bed and how much her new sweater costs. Sometimes things like that are just not interesting. Mr. Burtway liked this passage because it showed that even though someone might be our best friend, he or she could still drive us crazy. Beth Ann turned all the way around in her seat and sent wicked eyebrow messages to Mary Lou. Mr. Bookway flipped ahead in the same journal to another passage. He read, I think Jeremiah is pig-headed. His skin is always pink, and his hair is always clean and shiny, but he is really a jerk. I thought Mary Lou Finney was going to fall out of a chair. Alex was bright, bright pink. He looked at Mary Lou as if she had recently plunged a red-hot steak into his heart. Mary Lou said, No, I, no, it isn't what you think. I, Mr. Bookway liked this passage because it showed conflicting feelings about someone. I'll say it does, Alex said. The bell rang. First you could hear sighs of relief from the people whose journals had not been read, and then people started talking a mile a minute. Hey, Mary Lou, look at Alex's pink skin, and hey, Mary Lou, what does Beth Ann's father wear to bed? 
Beth Ann was standing one inch away from Mary Lou's face. I do not talk on and on, Beth Ann said. And that wasn't very nice of you to mention that. And I do not tell you everything. And the only reason that I ever men mentioned what my father wore to bed was because we were talking, if you will recall, about men's bathing suits being more comfortable than women's. And on and on she went. Mary Lou was trying to get across the room to Alex, who was standing there as pink as can be. Alex, she called. Wait, I wrote that before. Wait. It was a jing bang of a mess. I was glad I had to get out of there. He and I were going to the police again. We got in to see Sergeant Bickle right away. Phoebe slapped the newest message about the water in the well onto his desk, dumped the hairs which she had collected at, at Mrs. Cadaver's house on top of the message, and then placed a list of further items to investigate on top of that. Sergeant Bickle frowned. I don't think you girls understand, Phoebe went into a rage. You idiot, she said. She scooped up the message, the hairs, and her list, and stormed out of the office. Sergeant Bickle followed her while I waited, thinking that he would bring Phoebe back and calm her down. I looked at the photographs on his desk, the ones I had not been able to see the day before, and one was Sergeant Bickle and a friendly-looking woman, his wife, I suppose. And the second picture was of a shiny black car, and the third picture was of Sergeant Bickle, the woman, and a young man, their son, I figured. I looked closer. I recognize the son. It was the lunatic. Chicken and blackberry kisses. Gramps barreled through Wyoming like a house of fire. We snaked through winding roads where the trees leaned close, rustling. Rush, 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 rush. A road curved alongside rivers that rolled and gobbled. Hurry, hurry, hurry. It was late when we arrived at Yellowstone. All we got to see that evening was a hot spring. We walked on board walks placed across the bubbling mud. Huzzah, huzzah, Graham said, and we stayed at the old faithful inn in a frontier cabin. I'd never seen Graham so excited. She could not wait for the next morning. We're going to see old faithful, she said over and over. It won't take too very long, will it, I said. And I felt like a mule saying it because Graham was so looking forward to it. Don't you worry, Salamanca. Graham said, we'll just watch the old guys will blow it, and then we'll hit the road. I prayed all night long to the elm tree outside. I prayed that we would not get in an accident, that we would not, that we would get to Lewiston, Idaho in time for my mother's birthday, and that we would bring her home. But later, I'd realized that I had prayed for the wrong things. That night, Graham was so excited that she could not sleep. She rambled on about all sorts of things. She said to Gramps, Remember that letter from the egg man that you, f you found under the mattress? Well, of course I remember. We had a wing ding of an argument over it. You told me you had no dang idea how it got there. You said the egg man must have slipped into the bedroom and put it there. Well, I want you to know that I put it there. I know that, Gramps said. I'm not a complete noodle. It's the only love letter ever anybody ever wrote me, Graham said. You never wrote me any love letters. You never told me you wanted one. To me, Graham said, your grandfather nearly killed the egg man out over that letter. Hells, bells, Graham said. He wasn't worth killing. Maybe not, but Gloria was. <laughs> oh, yes, Graham said. Played his hand on his heart and pretended to swoon. Gloria, now you cut that out, Graham said, rolling over on her side. Tell me about Peavy. Tell me that story, but don't make it too awfully sad. She folded her hands on over her chest. Tell me what happened with the lunatic. When I saw the picture of the lunatic on Sergeant Bickle's desk, I tore out of that office faster than lightning. I ran past Sergeant Bickle standing in the parking lot. No sign of Phoebe. I ran all the way home to the house. As I passed Mrs. Cadaver's house, Mrs. Potters called me from the porch. You're all dressed up, I said. Going somewhere? Oh, yes, she said. I'm readable. She trotted down the steps, swinging a cobra cane in front of her. Are you walking? I asked. She reached down and touched her legs. Isn't that what you call it when you move your legs like I'm doing? 
No, I meant, are you walking to wherever you're going? Oh, no, it's much too far for these lakes. Jimmy's coming. He'll be here any minute. A car pulled up in front of the house. There he is, she said. She pulled out. She called out to the driver. I'm readable. I said I would be. Here I am. The driver leaped out of the car. Sal, he said. I had no idea you two were neighbors. It was Mr. Perkway. Well, not, I said. It's Phoebe who is the neighbor. Is that right, he said, opening the car door for Mrs. Partridge. Come on, Mom. Let's get a move on. Mom, I said. I looked at Mrs. Partridge. This is your son? Why, of course, Mrs. Partridge said. This is my little Jimmy. But he's a Berkway, Mrs. Partridge said. I was a Berkway once, and then I was a Partridge. I'm still a Partridge. Then who was Mrs. Cadaver, I said. My little Margie, she said. She was a Berkway, too. Now she's a Cadaver. I said to Mr. Berkway, Mrs. Cadaver is your sister. We're twins, Mr. Berkway said. When they had driven away, I knocked on Phoebe's door, but there was no answer. At home, I dialed Phoebe's number over and over. No answer. The next day at school, I was relieved to see Phoebe. Where were you? I said. I have something to tell you. She turned away. I don't want to talk about it. She said, I do not wish to discuss it. I couldn't figure out what was the matter with her. It was a terrible day. We had tests in math and science. At lunch, Phoebe ignored me. Then came English. Mr. Bookway skipped into the room. People were gnawing on their fingers and tapping their feet and wriggling around and generally getting ulcers, wondering if Mr. Bookway was going to read from the journals. I stared at him. He and Margaret Cadaver were twins? That was, was that possible? The most disappointing part of that piece of knowledge was that he was not going to fall in love with Mrs. Cadaver and marry her and take her away. Mr. Bookway opened a cupboard, pulled out a journal, slipped the yellow paper over the cover of one, and read, This is what I like about Jane. She is smart, but doesn't act like she knows everything. She is cute. She smells good. She is cute. She makes me laugh. She is cute. I got a prickly feeling up and down my arms. I wonder if Ben had written this about me. But then I realized that Ben didn't even know me when he wrote this, his journal. A little buzz was going around the room as people shifted in their seats. Christy was smiling. Megan was smiling. And Beth Ann was smiling. Mary Lou was smiling. Every girl in the room was smiling. Each girl thought that this had been written about her. I looked carefully at each of the boys. Alex was gazing nonchalantly at Mr. Bookway. Then I saw Ben. He was sitting with his hands over his ears, staring down at his desk. The prickly feeling traveled all the way up to my neck and then went skipping down my spine. He did write that. He did not write it about me. Mr. Bookway exclaimed, Ah, oh, love! Ah, oh, life! Sighing, he pulled out another journal and read, Jane doesn't know the first thing about boys. She even asked me what kisses taste like, so I could tell she didn't ever she hadn't ever kissed anyone. I told her that they taste like chicken, and she believed me. She is so dumb sometimes. Mary Lou Finney jumped out of her chair. You cabbage head, she said to Beth Ann. You beef brain. Beth Ann wound a strand of hair around her finger. Mary Lou said, I did not believe you, and I do know what they taste like, and it isn't chicken. Ben drew a cartoon of two stick figures kissing. In the air over their heads was a cartoon bubble with a chicken saying, Bwok, 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 bwok. Mr. Bookway turned a few pages in the same journal and read, I hate doing this. I hate to write. I hate to read. I hate journals. I especially hate English, where teachers only talk about idiot symbols. I hate that idiot poem about the snowy woods, and I hate it when people say that the woods symbolize death or beauty or sex or any old thing you want. I hate that. Maybe the woods are just woods. Beth Ann stood up. Mr. Berkway, she said, I do hate school. I do hate books. I do hate English. I do hate symbols, and I most especially hate those idiot journals. There was a hush in the room. Mr. Berkway stared at Beth Ann for a minute, and in that minute... I was reminded of Mrs. Cadaver. For that brief time, his eyes looked just like hers. 
I was afraid he was going to strangle Bethan. But then he smiled, and his eyes became friendly, enormous cow eyes once again. I think he hypnotized her because Bethan sat down slowly. Mr. Brookway said, Bethan, I know exactly how you feel. Exactly. I love this passage. You do, she said. It's so honest. I had to admit, you couldn't get more honest than Beth Ann telling her English teacher that she hated symbols and English and idiot journals. Mr. Buckway said, I used to feel exactly like this. I could not understand what all the fuss was about symbols. He rummaged around in his desk. I want to show you something. He was pulling papers out and flinging them around. Finally, he held up a picture. Ah, here it is. Dynamite. What is this? He asked Ben. Ben said, it's a vase, obviously. Mr. Brookway held the drawing in front of Beth Ann, who looked as if she might cry. Mr. Brookway said, Beth Ann, what do you see? A little tear dropped down on her cheek. It's okay, Beth Ann. What do you see? I don't see any idiot vase, she said. I see two people. They're looking at each other. Right, Mr. Brookway say, said, bravo. I'm right? Bravo? Ben said, huh? Two people? I was thinking the same thing myself. What two people? Mr. Brookway said to Ben, and you were right too. Bravo. He asked everyone else, how many see a vase? About half the class raised their hands. And how many see two faces? The rest of the class raised their hands. Then Mr. Brookway pointed out how you could see both. If you looked only at the white part in the center, you could clearly see the vase. If you looked only at the dark parts on the sides, you could see two profiles. The curvy sides of the vase became the outline of two heads facing each other. Mr. Bookway said that the drawing was a bit like symbols. Maybe the artist only intended to draw a vase. Maybe some people look at this picture and see only that vase. That is fine. But if some people look at it and see faces, what is wrong with that? It is faces to that person who's looking at it. And what is even more magnificent? You might see both. Bethan said, two for your money. Isn't it interesting? Mr. Bookway said, to find both. Isn't it interesting to discover that snowy woods could be death and beauty and even, I suppose, sex? Wow, literature. D did he say sex? Ben said, copying the drawing. I thought Mr. Buckway was finished with the journals for the day, but he made a great show of closing his eyes and pulling something from near the bottom of the stack. She popped the blackberries into her mouth, and then she looked all around. It was mine. I could hardly bear it. She took two steps up to the maple tree and threw her arms around it and kissed it. People were giggling. I thought I could detect a small dark stain as from a blackberry kiss. Ben looked at me from across the room. After Mr. Bookway read about my mother's blackberry kiss, he read about how I kissed the tree and how I have kissed all different kinds of trees since then and how each tree has a special taste all its own and mixed in with that taste is the taste of blackberries. By now, because Ben and Phoebe were staring at me, everyone else stared too. She kisses trees, Megan said. I might have died right then and there if Mr. Berkway had not immediately picked up another journal. He stabbed his finger into the middle of the page and said, I am very concerned about Mrs. Mr. Berkway stared down at the page. It looked as if he couldn't read the handwriting. He started again. <clears throat> I am very concerned about Mrs. Um, Mrs. Corpse. Her suspicious behavior suggests that she has murdered her own husband. Phoebe's eyes blinked rapidly. Go on, Ben said. Finish. You could tell that Mr. Buckway was regretting that he had ever started this business with the journals. But all around the people room, people were shouting, Yes, finish. And so he reluctantly continued. I believe that she had buried him in the backyard. When the bell rang, people went berserk. Wow, a murder. Who wrote that? And is it real? I was out of that room faster than anything chasing after Phoebe. Megan called out after me. You kiss trees? I tore out of the building. No Phoebe. Idiot journals, I thought. All oh, darn idiot journals.
time for your questions for set eight.